Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome again to Yamaha's On the Bench series with Paul Heinmarsh today. How are you doing, Paul? I'm okay, thank you. Nice to see you. It's been a long yeah. time. Yeah, it has been a long time. Um, so, obviously, people would know Paul lives in the UK, um, and you've done a lot of work for Yamaha and Line 6 specifically uh, in Europe, but also a lot here in the States. Um, and we've had a chance to hang out a few times when you've come to visit for NAM and stuff, but uh, I have missed you, man. So what have you been up to? <laughs> uh, well, obviously with, with lockdown, I've been uh, at home a lot. I've been eating a lot of kettle chips. Unfortunately, that's how I've been passing most of the most of the time. Uh, but for yeah. the most part, my my role has been unaffected. I'm sort of glad to say, you know, I kind of, I'm, still, I'm still working from home. I have a have a home studio here, so I'm still doing stuff from yeah, I, I love the look. I like the brick. Uh, you know, it looks like you got a really nice, cozy place to create. You know, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, I've got it all going on. This little lamp egg behind me just turned up about an hour and a half ago as well. So I haven't oh, even no. had a, I haven't even had a chance to plug that in yet. But it's a bit of a it's a, yeah, it's a bit of bit of a set dressing. I think is the is the is the term for that. That's very cool. So um, let's get into like your story. Uh, you know, you. Started working for Line Six when? What what time? So for me, for Line Six, it was a long time. But I mean, it was two thousand and eight when oh, I wow. started freelance with Line Six. So uh, so my background really is I came to Line Six from uh, from retail stores. So I actually came from music stores. I I, I, I like most people who go into music stores, you kind of feel like you'll work in a guitar store for a couple of years, and then your band will kick off, and you'll be a superstar. Uh, and then a couple of years later, I, I realized I was managing that department and then, you know, then eventually I was managing the shop and then eventually I was moving to different shops and I got caught up in the whole management, uh, <laughs> management thing in music stores, which was great. It was, you know, I had some great times with some great, you know, it's great to go to work and, and you think we take it for granted a little bit, you know, but to be around people who are like-minded, you know, like yeah. everybody you work with in a guitar store loves guitars. They all love music. You're not, you're not, you're not working there with somebody who, you know, is like from an alien you know, like an, from an alien viewpoint or anything. So yes, yeah, so oh, I did, yeah. that for, did that for a long time. And then when that store closed down, we, um, I was contacted by Line 6 to see if I, if I was interested in doing some demos. Uh, would I be interested in playing guitar for Line 6? And I was told that it won't be a full-time job. It'll just be a couple of days, maximum a week, uh, which worked perfectly for me at the time. Um, <laughs> and then yeah. I think it was sort of like nine years later that it became a full-time became a full-time sort of gig. Um, That's awesome. And, and during that time, I sort of, I spent that time learning how to, how to, you know, to, oh, I'm still learning, still learning to play guitar and do all these different things, but learned how to, to get better and better at doing video uh, as well, you know? So like, so now my job ultimately is doing video for line six. And um, yeah, I've kind of become, uh, you know, like when you're, when you're in the police force and then you sort of retire and they put you behind the desk, I've sort of, that's, <laughs> That's yeah. how I don't travel. I don't travel as much as I used to, but I've yeah, I've been very lucky with Line Six. I got to, got to see some, see and meet some fantastic people. Yeah, I mean your your videos are are legendary. They're pretty awesome, and uh, I've learned a lot from them. So right. before you started working in a music store, you know what what's your story playing guitar? I mean, um, did you start playing guitar specifically, or did you play other instruments, or? It was uh, it was bass guitar. I wanted to be a bass player. So again, I'm I'm old enough to have my the first bands that I got into were um, so the thing that got me into music was Frankie Goes to Hollywood. So yeah. I, did, which I, I still love those tracks. They're still epic tracks, you know. So I got it. That was the thing where it was like, right, I want to do. I want to be the bass player in Frankie Goes to Hollywood. And then because of that, because I got more interested in what this guitar with four strings was, it you know then got into sort of Duran Duran and. You know, and then I very much wanted to be John Taylor from Duran Duran, and still do, truth be told. Um, <laughs> and then the more I sort of got into the instrument, the, you know, get, you get introduced to sort of rock things, and so well, then it was Kiss, and it was uh, Kiss and Van Halen and David Lee Roth, and and then yeah. onwards through to through sort of joining bands, and and then getting into the whole funk rock thing was massive for me. That was my main, that was my main thing. So it was Living Color, it was Fishbone, it was. You know, it was, yeah. Poppers, it was Stevie Salas, it was all that stuff. And I still listened to it and then ended up being in kind of grunge type bands. And Yeah, I love Vernon yeah. Reed, man. He's he's killer. Absolutely. And I remember meeting him, you know, when I was in my 20s like at college and stuff. And he's just like such a killer player, very soulful. 
Uh, and yeah, I, I love that whole funk rock thing too. Like yeah. to the, you know, anywhere from like the jamming kind of funk rock to like the, I like the meters, just like that kind of funky kind of thing too. And I, I think it comes through in your playing. It's, it's very, uh, you know, sure. rhythmic and yeah. stuff. So that's awesome. And yeah, well, that's, that's nice to hear. So, uh, yeah, so you started playing in bands and stuff and then ended up, you yeah, know. Yeah, ended up working in, a, working in a store, yeah. I mean, I think we sort of tried to, you know, as everybody does, we tried to be a famous, you know, famous band all the way through the 90s and, and that sort of ran alongside working in a store. But working inside a store meant that I, had a, I got a great understanding of gear. You know, I got yeah. to, I was, you know, the shop that we worked in, we had a lot of really high-end sort of boutique uh, stuff over the years. And it was great to have experience of those things. And uh, that definitely helped with Line 6 as well. Yeah. You know, actually knowing what the gear sounds like and having hands-on experience with all these different sort of pedals uh, back then was uh, was great. Yeah, I uh, I love, you know, the whole working in a music store thing is great because it when you can't afford the gear, at least you get to hang out in the place where it's all hanging on the wall and you're allowed to play with it. Yes. So, you know, it's, it's like uh, being a, an automotive journalist. It's like you, you don't get to own the Ferrari, but you do get to drive it around uh, yes. a few times, a couple of hot laps. So um, that's really awesome. So, and you know, you've been demoing a lot of stuff for obviously for Helix, PodGo, um, and then over the years, you've you've done this so much, and, and you've been known for playing a lot of like the JTV guitars. Um, and some of the, you know, the very standards and stuff like that. But um, we actually had the opportunity to make you something um, yeah. bespoke. Uh, yeah, so you're have, on that here. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, I'm, 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 I was, I am, I was going to say, I was always a fan of the JTV. I'm still a fan of the JTV 69. I think it's a, I think it's a tremendous, tremendous guitar, and it saves. You know, for now when we have band practices, we have a, we have a couple of songs where. It, they were written on a like a seven string guitar with obviously a, like a, a low b string and now to be able to take the, the you know i take the, the jtv 69 and you know it saves me having to carry a whole guitar just for yeah. to do one song in a rehearsal so i still love that guitar and i was always a big fan of the uh the neck i was a big fan of james tyler guitars um yeah. so when we started work and i started working with line six be just before the jtv 69 came out i was one of the first people to demo that guitar i remember doing the the very very early demos of that um yeah and i just always loved the neck profile it felt very like the tyler guitars that i had you know so it was com it was immediately comfortable for me straight away you know i love that kind of i love that guitar and i still and i still play that that's great but, yeah but you know working in music stores you get it you get a great chance you know it's a great opportunity to collect a lot of gear as well you know so i, I haven't got a a crazy guitar collection although obviously i guess the i, I think most of my guitar collection is, is almost behind me there but a lot of the, you know, I have some really nice sort of vintage guitars and stuff that I that I, that I really like as well, you know. So that's awesome. Yeah. Um, did Did you guys uh, deal Tyler's at your store? Uh, we did actually. Yeah, the guy who used to um, the manager of the store was the first guy in the UK to import Tyler guitars. So, guitar guitar. Uh, it was the guy from Guitar Guitar, but it was ah. pre, it was pre Guitar Guitar. It was before he actually went there. So so yes, that's we cool. had. For a long time, we had. I'm not. So, I'm not so sure we were supposed to have Tyler guitars on the wall, and uh, but uh, we had. Yeah, we always had four or five Tylers on the wall. So, and, and I've, I've owned a lot of Tylers over the years. Um, cool. well. I still have one in a cupboard somewhere. I'm yeah. sure an old, an old '90s one. Yeah, I made a few of those. <laughs> yeah, and, I mean, I, I, it was fascinating. Sort of getting, uh, you know, originally getting talking to you, and you're talking about working for James Tyler. You know, I think that's a. That's a that's yeah. A cool I, thing. It, it, pretty short period it was you know a few months there um right after school but um it was very eye-opening and i did learn a lot from him and actually uh rafael our painter the, the guy who painted your guitar he worked there for many many years right. um and we met working together there and um when we had the opportunity to hire someone he, he had since moved on um before we hired him but uh you know we have always stayed friends and stuff and i you know when we had the opportunity to hire a painter i said i gotta get this guy he's like you know been one of my best friends for years he is the best in the business and uh you know i think your your guitar shows a little bit of that um you know just the the quality of the finish so um Absolutely. yeah let's, 
let, let's talk a little bit about your guitar yeah. um, and how it came to be. You know, I'll, I'll let you tell that story a little bit. Uh, I th yeah, I mean, obviously, with when when Yamaha got involved with with Line Six, um, it kind of became a bit time to 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 certainly get more and more into sort of Yamaha guitars, and obviously Yamaha. I've sold, obviously working in the music store, I've sold so many Yamaha Pacificas over the years. It's, you know, it's just crazy. It was, it was always one of the guitars that you could, no matter what you were demoing, whether it was a, you know, a, a matchless amp or, or whatever, you know, you always knew that if you just picked up a Yamaha, like a Pacifica 112, it was yeah. actually going to sound great and play great straight out of the box, you know, so I was, I was always a big fan of, of those. Um, and then I'd very much gone down the sort of the strat. So, sort of direction, you know, like sort of, you know, custom shop strats and things like that, which obviously I, I still love. And then we had such a, um, at Yamaha, when Revstar came out, there was such a push on Revstar in terms of the design and the, the sort of the aesthetic of, uh, you know, of, of those guitars that, um, and, and I, they, they looked so cool, you know, I really, really liked the way that they looked and I really wanted to have that on a Pacifica, you know, so for, for when Revstar first came out, I ended up it was part of my job. It was like I'm using Revstar all the time, you know, and, and and I'm not really a humbucker, you know, like a two humbucker sort of player like that. I mean, you need those yeah. guitars, and certainly when I need a guitar like that, the Revstar is the one, you know. Like I've got a Les Paul that again is like packed away in a case, and the Revstar has replaced has replaced all of that. But what I wanted to do was I wanted what I, the the nice features that I saw on the Revstar and the nice the you know the pains and the you know the scratch plates and things. And I very much wanted to bring that over and have it on a on a Pacific a style guitar and have some things on there that you know that I, that I don't have in any other guitars. You know, I don't really have anything with a reverse headstock, and you know, I'm obviously there's the Hendrix thing. You know, the Jeff Beck's got you know the, all the all, all those players that I'm seeing. It's like oh, I need a I need a reverse headstock. You know, so so it yeah. took me it took me a little while to convince Yamaha that I was worthy of a. As, as, as one of your Pacificas, but I got there in the end. It took a couple of years. <laughs> no, no, I, I, think I, I always wanted to. Um, I think that the issue was just time, you know. Um, at the time, you know, before Raphael and, and Andrew, our acoustic guitar builder, came on, uh, it was just me solo for like five years. So there was a, quite a backlog of artist projects and R&D projects and stuff. And um, yeah, I, I was really, you know excited when you know i saw your you made two kind of photoshop drawings of you know guitars that you like and one of them was this red star-esque version and one of them was like nickelodeon slime green you know pretty like 80s out there which i also really liked so did i tell did I, did I tell you the reason why why the, the the slime green one was actually part of getting it was a master plan of how yeah. to basically get this guitar built and uh, a very dear friend of, of ours you know simon jones was the, the guy who made this all happen and yeah. and so when i started messing on with photoshop and I, you know i kind of i really like to get into things like that i had the you know i was cutting out pictures of, of pacificas you know like not not in the old days like a scrap but i was cutting out pictures on photoshop and changing the color and putting the maple neck on them i've always like preferred maple necks um yeah. And I sort of built this guitar in the, the, the one that you saw, you know, and, and it went through all these different color stages and variations. And I was like, I know that Simon is a, like, like me, is a massive fan of Steve Vai in that 80s period, you know, in that green mini oh, yeah. Charvel. And the, so, yes, yeah, so there was a, it was a Pacifica with the green mini, green mini color yeah. with, a, with a black scratch plate. Um, and it was the thing, and it was the thing that Simon, you know, I'm sure he's watching this, you know, and I'm sure we'll get a comment from him soon, but it was that thing where it was like, if he sees this guitar, he's going to, he's going to make this project come to fruition, you know, and I'll, yeah, be, yeah. And I'll be put in touch with Pat, you know, and then, and then, so once we got those gates opened, then it turned into the sort of the Rev Star guitar, you know, so. Anything green for Simon is the way to go, I, <laughs> you know, uh, that, that's the way to his heart. Um, yeah, it was a very so, devious yeah. one. So it, it it was slightly devious, but I, I think uh, you know it, it was clever, really. Um, and you know it, it was cool because you said you wanted some of those parts of Revstar, and like you said, you know Revstar is it's a shorter scale length. You know, it's twenty four and three quarter. It's a set neck. It's all mahogany with a maple top. You know, it's a certain type of formula. Um, two humbuckers or or two P nineties. And it's just a thicker sounding guitar. It's a little different than, you know, what Pacifica is, which is a bolt-on guitar, 25 and a half inch scale. 
um, you know, with a tremolo, it's a, it's a little different, you know, um, bag of tricks there. Um, so I understood like what you were saying, you know, you're more of this kind of, you know, bolt on style player. Um, and it's, it's a different hand feel too, like, especially in your left hand, um, when you bend and stuff, because every time you bend the string, the trim dips a little bit, there's like a different feel. You kind of have a, a, a different gauge as to like how, when you bend a string, how much force it takes to go a half step or a whole step or, you know, step and a half or whatever it is, Absolutely. you know? So it, it's like, if you're a player and, and you know, Hey, I always gravitate towards this style, you know, um, it's hard to convince, you know, or, or to replace your number one guitar with something that's just cut from a different cloth, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, then you said, but I, I like the aesthetic. And that was a big part of Revstar. Um, you know, that whole aesthetic treatment on Revstar is something that internally we call butility. Um, it had to be beautiful, but utilitarian. Yeah. Um, and a lot of what the, you know, you, if you read, um, you know, some of the information about Revstar, uh, it's based on like the cafe racer style motorcycles yeah. um, that were popular in Europe um, in, in like the seventies. And there was some kind of industrial theme where like, you know, parts of those bikes, they were chopped off, uh, stripped down, they're more um, utilitarian, right? So what we were thinking when we came up with your guitar was, you know, that's also part of what we put into your Pacifica. And I think you made some really interesting choices where you're like, oh, I just want a straight up alder body. I want a maple neck, just like a one piece maple neck. Um, and, you said the only other thing that you want is the piezo bridge. Um, yeah. So it has the bags, uh, X bridge, two point tremolo. Um, and then, you know, we added that Revstar pickguard style. Um, so the, the, I think that was um, interesting because it, it told me that it came across correctly with Revstar is, you know, that style, that look. Um, you know, what was important to you enough that you wanted it to translate. Absolutely. You know, when you, you know, when you talk about that, the cafe racer and sort of stripping bits off guitars, it goes, it goes right back to where I started off with the Van Halen thing again, you know, I mean, that was essentially what he was doing and, you know, like losing volume controls and pickup selector switches and running things just back down to, you know, down to a volume pot. So it's all that appealed to me from, from day one. Um, so yeah, I mean, bringing bringing all that stuff over, you know, I mean, obviously, I think everybody's kind of probably seen this guitar by now, but it's absolutely become my my number one guitar. It's the only thing, it's the only thing I play, you know, like unless I'm just wanting to try something else for the sake of it. But this is my this is my go to instrument, you know. Um, so yeah, some fantastic things on there, you know. The, the scratch, you'll be pleased to see the scratch plate sort of aging very nicely now. The copper copper sort of pick guard that you put on there because that looked very different on. That looks very different on day one, you know, it's been, it's yeah. been played in a lot. And I mean, the other thing, I mean, I went back through some of the emails that we had um, today, you know, just in sort of preparation for this. And I was surprised, there was actually a lot of emails back and forwards, you know, it was, it, there, was it, there was quite a lot. I, I, I'd forgotten there was so much stuff going on because, I mean, the, the story, I suppose, picking up from there was once once we convinced um, the powers that be to, to make this guitar happen is we had... Um, a guy called James Crow, who's a sort of guitar luthier down in uh, Milton Keynes here. Um, and he he came up to my house and he, he basically went through all the guitars that I love, you know, so I've got like, I've got an old Strat that he that he measured up and stuff. Or I've got to, and, and, and all those different neck profiles and he measured them and he obviously sent them to, sent them over to you. And he was sort of a very, very important guy, certainly at the start of the, the start of this project, you know, so, so the neck was modeled on it was like an amalgamation of the different guitars that are that are liked and obviously your knowledge from from tyler and 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 a lot of it's like a jtv 69. You know, yeah you know james was very instrumental in you know trying to find what exactly you liked about some of your other guitars and you said well you know i really like just kind of how fat this neck is so uh and also like the width of the nut um and we kind of went back and forth on adding some details or subtracting and, and things. So 
one of the things was you did like that Tyler that you've been playing and you're like, oh, I, I like the shape of this neck. I like the thickness of it. Um, and, you know, so I was like, okay, we got, I can't fly across the pond to uh, come measure things in, in person. And, and James was really helpful in coming by, getting some calipers on the first fret, the 12th fret, like give me more measurements. Give me, you know, like what is your preferred width of the nut there? Or, um, you know, just kind of like sound wise, what you're going for when we picked like what pickups we're going to put in there. Um, but you know, the, one of the things was also like, oh, I really want that copper pick guard. So we made all the copper plates and we aged all of it. Um, and then, you know, the other thing was you said, oh, I want that nitro finish, but I want it to be like the same color. I want it to be the matte kind of, um, flat gray, kind yeah. of like a primer color. Um, it's the rusty, rusty rat color, isn't rusty it? Rat, that's, yeah. that's, that's the, the color. Yeah. And I remember going back through those emails, the thing that sort of freaked me out about this guitar is every time you sent me a photograph, it was like black. And I'm like, no, I don't want it black. I want it the same as the rusty rat. And you're like, no, no, when you see it, it it's not black. You know, it's like, it's a, and it's, a, it's an unusual color because it catches the light in such a weird way that sometimes it's gray. I've taken photographs where it looks almost blue. Like sometimes yeah. it looks black, you know, so it's kind of, it's uh I call it like engine gray, you know, it, it's, it's the bluish gray. Um, it's kind of weird because like on my bench, I have lights in a certain way. Like I have them hanging left and right. And I also have like the ceiling lights because I need to be able to see like every scratch or glare or, or you know, like just so when it's done, I know that it's like perfect in every way it could be before I hand it off or, or give to an artist or, you know, just deliver in general. So when I go and take pictures, it's not always the best, you know, lighting for photos. So like uh, this happened to me yesterday. I was making a guitar for Jeff Schroeder and um, the color, it's kind of like this uh, burgundy mist kind of flat color, but it almost looks like purple in the picture. Right. But, it, you know, it's when you see it in person, it's definitely more pink. Um, so I, it's always hard, you know, I, I have to kind of manage everybody's expectations when you're doing the, the dance to, to yeah. say, hey, trust me, it's going to, you know, when you see it, when you play it, it's going to be a little different. Um, yeah. And, you know. And, yeah. and it's it's exactly the same. I mean, I've had this guitar at uh, UK shows now, and uh, we've had it up side by side with the Rusty Rat guitar, which I, I thought I was going to have here today, but I haven't actually got the Rusty Rat version of the Red Star here. But, uh yeah, side, seeing them sort of side by side is, uh, was 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 cool to see, to see it like this. And the nitrocellular was finished. I think the the other thing was that we, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of relic guitars. You know, and yeah. like you know, we weren't so keen to do, or you weren't so keen to do the relic job on it. But but what you did have was the idea of, well, we'll make the finish super super thin so it ages naturally. You know, and and I, like I said, I've got an old Strat, and the finish on that is super. Is super thin, you know. I'm always trying to touch it because it because it gets marked. And and I do remember getting to getting this guitar just before Nam, and coming in the room and just being like, "Wow, that just looks amazing!" You know, like I was blown away. I absolutely loved it. And I loved everything about it, and still do the neck profile. And but I loved the look of it. And I remember like some of my, you know, very early thoughts were, "I don't want this to age. I don't want the, I want the guitar to stay like this. I need it to stay. I don't want it to chip. I don't want it to da you get damaged." Yeah, um, but because you could because we had asked and we'd, we'd put the very very thin finish on um it, it has aged quite a lot so even i mean i think by the time i even got it away from nam it was yeah. i think the strap had like knocked a hole in it in the side and stuff you know so it's it, but you know and i'm totally happy with that i'm totally happy with it aging like that because that was the that was the plan but you know when you first get a new toy and it was like oh i don't think i actually want this to age this is too this is too nice you know yeah the, you know that's kind of an interesting thing for me is uh i do get a lot of requests to age or, or you know artificially age some instruments and i've done quite a few these days um but it's not really like my go-to um just because I, it's harder to make, uh, you know, a super pristine guitar. So it's like I'm always trying to work my hardest and like make the perfect instrument and just make no mistakes, which is really really hard, especially if everything's a one-off. Um, yeah. You know, if if I was just making, you know, a hundred Paul Hindmarsh signature Pacificas in a row, 
it towards the end it gets a lot easier to like make sure that they're all perfect and you know but everything i do is is like a one off so um the nice part about doing the aging is if you're walking around with it and it takes a takes a lick uh it, it's part of the show you know um but Absolutely. and yeah. it, makes way, it makes way more sense you know like, i mean i think i do i mean you correct us if i'm wrong but I, I definitely feel like nitrocellulose makes a difference to the sound and like the thin finish and everything as well, you know. So I was very, from working in a store, I could I could always tell what was nitro and which what wasn't, you know. Like, and I very much preferred the nitro sort of sort of thing, um, you know. And I've got some like bits of age guitars. I know that it's very divisive the uh, the the relic thing and that, and, and I totally get why. Um, yeah. But I think you know, like on some guitars now, the finish is so thick that the idea of going out and gigging with that guitar and and relicking it yourself. To the degree of some of the relics that we see today, it's just I, unfortunately we don't live long enough or gig enough to <laughs> anybody does to, to to do that, you know. Unless you're literally throwing the guitar around and trying to smash it, but the idea of having a you know a '50s Strat where it's all completely worn down, it's like you couldn't wear through a finish. Yeah, like, well, you know, if if you think about the finish, what what nitrocellulose is, it's actually cotton fiber that's like pretty much liquefied, right? And what happens is um, it sprays very thin to begin with. So I, I don't particularly um, subscribe to the thought that nitro sounds better than other finishes. It's more about how thin the finish is on the instrument and adding weight to it that damps it's a, it's like a dampening effect right uh, because the finish itself doesn't breathe it doesn't you know allow moisture or oxygen or whatever to come in and out through that barrier it's yeah. mostly just that the thickness of it is quite low and you know you can get a modern finish to be very very thin but it's true that it won't kind of chip and nick and age the same way it's built to be shiny for a long time essentially permanently yeah. um, be glossy or matte or whatever it is and that nitro finish because it's such an old technology um it's brittle in some respect but it's also kind of um it could be gummy if it has like plasticizer in it or something like that and um the the issue with it is little flakes will chip off and that's why you see a lot of these old vintage guitars they just look beat to hell because um no matter how delicate you are with it it's just gonna get roughed up and um I, that's why when you said oh i want nitro and i kind of want it aged i said well we'll just make it really thin nitro and and because it was a satin top coat um the the difference between matte and, and glossy is when it's glossy you have to spray more so you sand it level you have to sand it flat and then buff it and it has to be enough material when you buff you're not going to burn through the color um so a matte guitar is always going to be thinner finish than a glossy guitar so i was like well if you want the absolute thinnest let's do nitro we'll do it matte and by the time you get it, you know, you play it for a couple of years, you're going to age it, you know, and it'll be natural. It'll, it'll look like it should. Um, and that was also part of what we did with Revstar, too. If you look at, you know, the brushed black finishes from RSP20 or from that rusty wrap color, um, the whole idea is, yeah, um, it's, it's a modern finish because... Um, you know, the, there's a few reasons for that, um, having the modern finish, but we want it to age rapidly for the player. So when you get it, um, you put your own, you know, thumbprint on it. You put your own stamp on it. And it's a modern guitar, modern finish that's going to hold up. It's going to protect the guitar. Um, but also, you know, nitro is not the best for the environment in terms of, um, you know, the... VOC is what they call it. Uh, although, you know, our facility is state of the art, so it, none of that escapes. Um, yeah. And we paid quite a bit of money to make sure that that's the truth. Um, you know, the, the, the whole idea is if you're going to make a production guitar, it has to be, you know, reliable results every time. It has to be able to withstand the heat, humidity, temperature, um, 
you know, restraints that we, Yamaha puts every product through. It's called um, QMS, um, quality management system, right? And, and every one of our products has to live up to this standard of quality. That's why when you said, uh, I'd play a match list and I'd pick up a Yamaha Pacifica 112, it's that known quantity of when you pick up a Yamaha instrument, you know what you're going to get. Um, and it's always going to be a certain level of quality that you can expect. And I think that's like really a, a hard thing to do. Um, and that's why when we wanted to do kind of a, a guitar that can age with you, we did that kind of brushed finish that you see on those rev stars. Yeah. Um, and I thought, you know, it's very cool to kind of translate it to your Pacifica. Um, but also, you know, the other part of it is that copper pick guard too. Yeah. So well, like when you hold it up, you can see there's some bits that are shiny from like where you pick yeah. uh, and some parts are, are more pitted and, and dark. Um, so, you know, we made a, a copper pick guard and we aged it, we pit it and make it look a certain way. And it looked, you know, relatively uniform when it was brand new and then, when you play it, it ages with you and stuff. And, and that's kind of how I felt about um, aging guitars in general. I, I always want the player to age it themselves yeah. uh, and play it because it means I made the guitar well, you want to keep playing it, and you've taken it to so many gigs and traveled with it that it got some licks, you know? Um, so I, I think that, you know, a lot of those aspects of Revstar made its way to this guitar. Yes. Um, and then, you know, we went a little bit beyond as well, you know, so we, we did the reverse headstock, which I thought was, uh, very fun. Yeah. Um, I love that. I love yeah. that. It's very popular for people to see this. The, the, the image right now is flipped. So, uh, it looks like you're left-handed, but, uh, it's, it's a, it's a right-handed guitar, uh, with, uh, you know, the, oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. <Hey. laughs> that threw me for a loop. Jeez. Um, yeah, I have switches that do all kinds of things. <laughs> oh, jeez. That's so cool. Uh, yeah. So, you know, the, the reverse headstock, you're one of the, a couple of guys have asked for them. Um, but because I had to draw up a, a new blueprint, and anyways, for the next shape, I was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do reverse headstock. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. It, it's great. I mean, it's a great headstock shape anyway. I've always liked the Pacific shape, but I definitely, I definitely like having it. It's just a little bit different, isn't it? Having it sort of upside down as well. I mean, some of the great things that I like, I loved about this guitar as well is like the, the forearm contour. That's not a, that's no, not a Pacific. No, that's that's you. You that's something for, from you as well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the the whole idea it was, um, you know, I just took the outline of Pacifica and the headstock shape, those are untouched. Um, but everything else, I was just like, what can I do to make this closer to Revstar, um, to make it look more like they're part of the same family? Um, so number one was the pick guard um, and that shape of the pick guard, which yeah. also shares the shape with uh, you know, the modern BB bases. Um, so we- Yeah, so you're, you're, ref you're referring to it just being cut off? Cut off here, yeah, no. There, but you know, um, because it's it's got pickups, um, you know, closer to the neck and stuff. Um, we wanted to cover the the neck and middle pickup, so um, just like the BB bases, it kind of has like the swooping base side with like the kind of point, and that kind of harks back to some older vintage Yamaha instruments. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, we, we did all the contours and then the neck pocket is a little different. The, the back of the instrument is a bit different than what a standard Pacifica is too. It's got that scoop out heel. Yeah. Um, it's got really, really comfortable. Different tummy contour as well. Um, that's, you know, pretty deep. Um, I, I like to kind of draw the shapes, put the surfaces in there, and then, you know, in 3D, I, I really play with all the shapes and try and make it um, as, I don't know, it's, it's yeah, you're always trying to make something beautiful, so I'm just always like, oh, how do, I, I, 
it's it's hard to describe, but uh, it's it's like sculpting in some way where I'm just like, eh, I need it to, to play a certain way. Yeah, well, no, you achieved it. I, mean, I think it's a tremendous guitar, and it's think that the amount of compliments that I get on this guitar, you know, it's, uh, it's tremendous. It should, it should be a, it should be a stock model, shouldn't it? <laughs> uh, you know, I get more requests for uh, us to make that guitar than pretty much like any instrument that I've made. Um, that and, and the Patitucci bass, um, I, I get a lot of requests for. But um, Is there a request for this particular guitar. Yeah, the, your your particular guitar. People love the color and the look of it and stuff. So. Hear a lot of that, but I thought it was only coming my way. It's nice. Oh no, no, I get plenty. You know, um, and I think probably the most liked post on my Instagram is your guitar. Yay! That's good to know. Yeah. So it it's you know it was an interesting project. We did the dovetailed neck joint as well. Um, you know, it, it has. Yeah, I mean, that's a fantastic thing, and that it's not something I've seen a lot of talk about. I mean, is that is it is it common knowledge what you're doing there with the dovetail neck joint? Um, I, I think, you know, dovetails have been around for a long time. People know them. Um, you know, I learned, you know, just kind of through other luthier friends, techniques and things like that. And, um, you know, so I just tried to take it a little step further and, you know, make this contoured heel, make the, the dovetail. So pretty much the, the neck taper doesn't continue straight. Uh, when it gets to the body, it, it kind of loops in and, and creates a dovetail. So you okay. can't move the neck yeah. in the pocket at all. And it, it looks fantastic. I mean, I, I was blown away when you sent the original sort of photographs because that's not something that I, I mean, I've, I've sold a lot of guitars, but I haven't necessarily taken a lot of guitars to bits. So it was not, it was all new for me that I hadn't seen that, that neck joint before, you know, and, and we're not talking about something that's actually visible you know, without taking the neck off, I'd have to take that off to, to see that, you know, it's a, it's such a cool, such a cool thing, you know. Yeah. And, and the next part is like, it, it it's flush, like where, where the body meets the neck, like those portions, you know, normally like the neck pocket, it, that wood is like really, really thin on the treble side, you know, so you get a lot of chips on paint and things in that section. Um, it, this way it kind of beefs it up a little bit and it makes a nice clean seam on both sides. Um, I'm just neurotic about like, you know, making things uh, fit very tightly and, and perfectly. So it, yeah. it, it was fun for me. Um, but, I'm you know, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still buzzing about having this guitar, you know, it's, uh, it's fantastic. And I can't, and I can't, I mean, I've got used to it in a lot of ways, you know, so going back through the emails today and seeing it with the, you know, with no paint on and seeing that neck pocket that you'd, you'd made and seeing all the different bits and, you know, pictures of you holding up different bits, you know, bit different pickup covers. And, but I think some of those things I was, I definitely wanted the cream, you know, yeah. like the, the sort of nickel, um, humbucker surround as well. And, yeah. and, and, and then getting your age, all those parts up as well as, uh, yeah, like all the tuners, the bridge, the pickup rings, the knobs, they I buy them all brand new, shiny. Um, yeah. They were all chrome, and then we we age them um, yeah. a bit. So, uh, you know, we we have our own special little process for making them pitted and, and beat up and stuff. Um, and, yeah, the, the really great Lawler pickups, I pretty much every artist guitar that I make, I, I end up using their pickups just because – they sound amazing, and I, I don't have to worry about you know any um, you know eh, maybe I don't love the sound. Can we try something else? It's just always perfect every time. So yeah, that that was so. That, I mean, it's the it's the uh, the blackface. Yeah, blackface singles on this and the imperial and the and the yeah. a lot of stuff that I mean this you know I, I wanted to have a big input on this guitar, but it was a lot of it was cosmetic. Like yeah. what I didn't want to be doing was sending you emails telling you exactly what I thought you know what I what I thought was best and telling you how to do your job you know so I was very happy for the for you to choose the pickups and everything and, and I'm you know I'm delighted with them as well they sound they sound great yeah you know and and I never really take um, you know that to heart because I think you know everybody has their own idea of what their their tone is what they want out of their sound and. You know, at the end of the day, you're playing the guitar, not me. So um, uh, some folks do leave things up to me. They they trust, um, I guess, my judgment. Which, I mean, you know, I wouldn't. But uh, you know, um, well, yeah, that's, yeah. That's not what you said in those emails earlier on. Right? <laughs> 
<laughs> no, uh, but I, I think um, I'm always just trying to guide everybody to like, you know, to what I think is going to be what they're after. Um, and, you know, you've played a lot of guitars. Uh, the other thing that you've done too is you've got to play a lot of really cool Yamaha guitars that not a lot of people have played. I mean, you, the, getting a custom guitar um, from Yamaha, it's the shop's not open to the public, unfortunately, uh, not yet at least. Um, so it's difficult um, because you know you are kind of like our F1 pilot. You're you're giving us ideas. We're we're doing this kind of like live R and D where we make custom instruments. We learn from the artists. Um, and one of those things that you got to do was go to Japan um, and play a lot of these guitars, a lot of prototype guitars, things that never made it to the store shelves, to the racks. Um, and, you know, I've been there. I got to, to play a lot of cool stuff. Um, I opened it like every case in that place. Um, I as many as I could. As many. Yeah. There's so many guitars ever. And, and you shot that video. I mean, tell us about that experience for you. Um, you're one of the very few that kind of gets to go into the into the the, the catacombs, as it yeah. were. You know, absolutely. No, I was. I mean, it was a kind of a, a dream come true, and in, in, I guess in a lot in a lot of ways. You know, I mean, i would never been to Japan before, so I mean, you know, the fact that I I had the foresight to to design a green meanie guitar on Photoshop and convince a boss in, in, in line six and in the Yamaha to, and I just ended up on this journey of, of obviously like speaking to yourself, getting the guitar. But like you say, also going to Japan and going to Hamamatsu, I got to visit the factory, uh, the, well, the archive, well, first of all, got to visit the museum where they actually have all of the old, you know, all of the old guitars that have, you know, like all the historical pieces from Yamaha's, uh, from Yamaha's past. And then I think the amazing thing for me in there was just how much of an impact Yamaha has had on my life before I even realized it, you know, I mean, I was genuine, I mean, the, both the videos are, are live now, um, but in that first video, I was walking around that factory and it was at the museum, sorry, and it was like genuine, you're like, that's the first four track re cassette recorder, this is how I learned to record guitar, you know, and then it was like, and here's the Pacifica guitar, and you know, and there was like, you know, keyboards that I think that my brother used to have when he was a kid, and it's like, wow, Yamaha's been in my life all this time, like, and a lot of it just sort of un unnoticed, you know, in, so in some in some ways. And then we got to go to, Hama uh, to the Art Guitar Archive, which is where I got to see, which I was, I mean, I was going to bring up before because the the Rev Star obviously went through a whole bunch of different changes. There was all kinds of different uh, Rev Stars, but I got to see the the very first prototype which had the 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 copper scratch plate and the original sort of rusty rat finish so yeah. so that's the video that i think that video went live to just today yeah so you will get to see me so literally in the in the room that you're talking about just opening all these cases and finding all these uh all these amazing amazing guitars you know and and, and it, it just kind of it, it, it inspires us as well i mean you can see in the background there i've got one of the rgx a2 guitars the white the white guitar yeah. that was a guitar i used to see in by the time that guitar came out, I was I was a manager of music stores as opposed to just a, a salesman. So I was gen, generally dealing with like a lot of issues that weren't necessarily sales related. And I used to see that guitar on the wall and think like, that's really interesting. That guy. And I would go for it and then somebody, at my attention would have to go somewhere else. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I saw the bunch of prototypes for that in, in, that, in the guitar archive as well, you know, like all kinds of different colors. And, and learned a little bit more about how they built that guitar, you know, with the sustainable woods and the, you know, the sort the the the, the, the softer or the, the lighter wood in between, and you know, and that and and that was all really really fascinating, you know. So I came back and actually I thought I need to have one of those guitars. So I, I tried to order one from Yamaha and it got discontinued. So I was on eBay and I had to buy. It. So I actually bought that guitar from there. But but yeah, I mean the archives full of the some of the just the weird and wacky guitars that Yamaha have built, you know, like some great shapes, you know, like the SJV guitars, you know, like I love the shape of those. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we found some fantastic ones of those that were all custom painted by, you know, like like sort of graffiti, well, uh, artists over in Japan. Um, so, yeah, that was a great, great experience, you know, and so we there's, there's two videos of that, and then and then obviously I just like, I, you know, whether people want us to or not, I try to shoehorn some playing in there, you know, so I got to, we had a, um, Obviously, we had a, obviously had a film crew, and so the last two days of the trip, we had uh, we sat there in the in the warehouse, and I recorded a bunch of backing tracks. Um, 
And then I was able to pick these guitars I've never seen before and put a bass line down, put a rhythm guitar part down, and put a lead part down and have it all have it all sort of professionally filmed, you know. So I was editing that today and it's like, wow, this is a this was a this is something something quite special. You know, it was a bit of a career highlight, I think, you know, like going through that video stuff today and you know, like having yeah, so cool. Having, having real camera people running around and filming me making noise is great, you know. So so yeah, this I mean this whole this whole trip with this actually getting a guitar built it came into it developed into so much more, you know, with the with the trip to Japan and everything, you know. So it all yeah. came kind of green meanie guitar. That's cool. I mean, and you think about that too. It's like you're the only person who's recorded those instruments. It's like the, the it's so unique to you now. You know, like those sounds can only be made by you. You know, it's just like that's really you know. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's that's that was the original thing that I wanted to do with the video. I mean, it turned into you know me doing the the little bit of a guy like a talk around the the, the archive and around the museum. Um, but I'm very much a player. I would. Think more than a talker, it becomes much more natural to me. Natural to me, you know. So, I think it was the the idea of of guitars that sit in cases now, you know, in the archive because they they they're back in the case now. I'm pretty sure they're not getting played. There, you know, I was able to record a, a song on the very first Yamaha uh, electric prototype that I think they ever made. Um, it yeah. was, oh, it was a 1965 one. It was made out of piano wood, the big red. Yeah. Red, Weigh, I don't know if you ever saw that. It weighed a ton, like really heavy guitar. But that was like the, I think there may have been another a pair of them, and but I def, it was definitely the it was the pro it was before Yamaha when Yamaha were just thinking maybe we should make some electric guitars, you know, like and and not, and, and that was yeah. So I actually got to record a song with that, you know, which is which is quite special, really, you know. That's it's a real privilege, and and you know, like just prototype guitars. I think the um, I think one of the one of the disappointing things from the trip. I mean. It didn't really appear in the video, but before I went out there, the I'd seen pictures of in, like internally of this most beautiful guitar. The one, the uh, it's the the guitar that had the Japanese logo on it, and it been, looked like it'd been dipped in paint. Yeah, I, I, I loved that guitar, and it was like I'm gonna get there and I'm gonna play this guitar and I'm gonna write, I'm gonna make a song for this guitar, and and I couldn't wait to play it. And I found it in the case. I didn't know what it was called, but eventually I pulled it out. I was like, right, let's plug this in, and I went to plug it in, and. It, it wasn't. It had no jack socket. There was no. It was, <laughs> design, it was a design idea, just purely for the cosmetics. Yeah. Like, Guys, surely you could have just. <laughs> How much extra work was it? <laughs> You'd be surprised. We've we've actually done a lot of kind of like proof of concept things where it's like not a full blown functional instrument. It's it's a cosmetic thing or like we you know it's it's interesting. Sometimes we'll make like just a flat two dimensional like profile of an instrument. And then we'll do a big printout and laminate it on top. And we'll just sit like sit with it and be like, do we even want to go down the road of, you know, engineering this whole thing completely. And, and we'll do that for like design concepts and we'll do like a little focus group, like, okay, tell us what you think about these shapes. And then people, you know, will tell us or artists or whoever and just say, well, that's really weird. That's very cool. I mean, the the cool part is like you get to see all those really weird guitars. And I always say, you know, Yamaha invented weird. <laughs> like we always did really out there stuff. And I think it's really interesting because we weren't afraid to like try something different. Nothing is holy. You know, it's just like just go forward, you know, into the unknown and, and make something different. And Absolutely. While we did make many conventional instruments. And, you know, obviously Pacifica has been around for a very long time and it's a known formula. Um, it's, you know, we always did different stuff, especially like the SG2, SG3, SBG. Um, you, you look at some of the SB5A bases, those like flying samurai instruments and stuff. Yeah. It's just, that's the next on my shopping list is one of those flying samurais. Unless, of course, you want to make one. Maybe, yeah. maybe you can make one for me and we'll, uh, and we'll go back to Hamamatsu. There, maybe there are something. so many of these like vintage instruments that I've been dying to make. I've been dying to make um, you, you know, some of the hollow bodies, um, you know, the SA-15, you know, which is kind of like this interesting single cut with a long treble horn or SA-30s, SA, you know, like... Actually, Simon got an SA30 um, recently, one of the green ones, of course, and that looks so cool. I can't wait to work on that thing. 
Um, but actually, yeah, here we got a, a little request. Can you go through some of the, the pickup positions? Give us a little sound here. I can. But we were requesting a light crunch tone. Does that, sound good? Does that sound loud enough? And it's great. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So. So yeah. So this is the uh, the neck pickup. It's a it's a big jump in volume to go to the uh, the uh, imperial. Yeah, it sounds great. What what are you playing it through? <laughs> it's through through helix. Yeah. For a second, for a second there, I was going to play a joke and pretend I was playing through some 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 completely different product, but then I thought that might not be very cool. <laughs> I get <so> like, <laughs> it might be the last joke I ever make. But yes, it's <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, know, you can even turn it up a little bit because I think you're getting gated a little um, by the program here. But yeah, give us some uh, give us some tones here. Give us. I mean, you're known for doing all these demos for us and and just making great sounds. So. Um, give us some of your favorites. Uh, yeah, so I mean, that's I mean, that's gonna be the same sort of sound, that sort of plexi type sound with a, an air apparent um, overdrive on there. <laughs> Just I can probably just mute my lapel mic there. So I think you're probably hearing that as well. So I'll just go, I'll mute that and I'll just go through a bunch of sort of different things with different pickup selections. Uh, and also, I think I, I, I've got a, a piezo patch there as well, so we can hear it as a, um, and, and it's sort of a piezo acoustic mode through a helix as well. So I'm going to mute this. And, yeah. and, and, you know, explain a little bit about the piezo. You know, we wired it so um, when you pull it, it pretty much mutes the mag pickups and it just goes straight out piezo, no preamp, and then you preamp everything with Helix. So, you know, tell us about how you kind of craft your acoustic sound there with the Helix. Yeah, so, I mean, exactly like you said. So I was I was interested in having the piezo, because um, again, for some things, I mean, I, I generally it's an original band I play with all the time, but, you know, we do, it's nice to have like bits of acoustic stuff for an intro and you know, I can be quite lazy sometimes, and I don't want to carry a whole collection of guitars and things. So um, this, what I asked you to do, which you very kindly did, was actually put the, the piezo in the, um, in the, it's the yellow bags bridge, isn't it? So you put in the yellow bags. Sorry, I'm getting all tangled. Not tangled up yet. Um, and exactly like you say, once I pull that out, it disconnects the pickup selector switch, disconnects the volume, and gives me a, a, an acoustic sound straight into Helix, which I've added some of the acoustic IRs on there as well. <laughs> that sounds so realistic. <laughs> That's pretty awesome, isn't it? For, for it being, you know, there's no there's no clever fancy modeling or anything going on there. I've literally just got a um, an acoustic IR. I've got some uh, compressor and a little bit of reverb on there. 
just really started to get to, to get into you know like a little bit more this week you know like just trying to find some uh, acoustic irs and things for, for stuff like that you know and i mean I, i'm used to having a very versatile guitar um from having the just from playing the variax with such a long time you know like so it's great to have a little bit of um it's not it's not very x technology but it's used to have some of that sort of um flexibility with uh with this guitar that's incredible yeah so i mean clean i mean it's, it's like on a cleaner sound <laughs> over on the neck pickup and it's really on this that you hear the big so so there were deliberately um mismatched pickups i believe that you you wanted to put in here and it, and it totally works because i get the big rock sound straight away but you can very much hear it on a on the on the clean sound so that's the neck pickup and then over to the imperial clean sounds and everything in there in there as well yeah um and i don't normally do a lot of stuff with the trem you know but it's uh and, and one of the reasons i stopped doing that and that's, it's something i want to get a bit a little bit more into again when you know being, being the the whole steve Vai thing way way back i used to overdo the trem and then eventually just like moved away from it and i never really played a trem but i do i'd be interested to get your feelings on this as well I, 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 a lot of the times on on nearly all my other guitars i just fix the bridge down completely so it's yeah. always fixed bridge, but whenever I play an actual fixed bridge guitar, I don't like it so much. I think uh, I really get off on the sound of the strings almost, you know, because I, I tend to play a lot of guitar that's when I'm not plug you know, plugged into anything. So I'll pick up a, I'll pick up a guitar and and losing the string seems to lose something for me, you know, so I've always shied away from. It's a mini reverb tank in the guitar, you know, yeah. it's, it's really what it is. And, um, you know, like I saw that you removed the back plate. Uh, I would typically do the same as well. So like if you hold it a little tighter, like to probably mute them a little bit, but it, everything plays a factor in the instrument. So like when you remove that material for like the spring cavity and, and for the block and stuff, it's going to change the sound and it's also changing how stiff the body is. So what we do a lot of the times um, with new products that we're designing is we have like a 3D modeling uh, software that tells us like how the body flexes and moves and in harmony with the neck, you know? So we're always trying to tune this, like the, you know, the aspect of, of these instruments and, and try and really understand when we make a decision, our, our, our hypotheses, you know, uh, correlating to what, the real instrument is um, so there there is a big thing and it's also like that that feel as well like what we talked about previously where you know if you put a hardtail bridge on there um, it's even if you block it it's gonna feel different when you bend the strings versus when there's just the straight hardtail strings through the body you know it's it's a different feel on your left hand um, and also you know you got that reverse headstock so like your bass string you can pull a little bit more it's got a little slinkier feel yeah um but you know it's it's good for a long string to be stretched a little longer and and you know the tension changes a little bit um so there there are a lot of factors that go into you know yeah, making no, it's interesting because like, it's I, I don't think i've really ever mentioned it before you know like that just that idea of because it would always seem like i should really have a hard tail guitar you know but every time i've tried one it's always been like yeah this is not really working the way should you know like and and even though i'm not doing it is it's like it's that's reverbs you know that time because i'm i often just pick up a guitar and i'm not plugged into anything so i actually sort of respond to that sort of reverb a little bit more um yeah so yeah but like i was gonna say it was when i when when you first handed me this guitar 
it was like, oh, this actually stays in tune really well. The trem really works and it's it's great, you know. So I've caught, I started getting a little bit more into into sort of tremolo stuff again, you know. So it's kind of changed my playing a little bit this guitar as well. You know? Yeah, well, um, we put the Goto locking tuners on there, the 510 lockers, those are great. Um, probably my favorite tuner, those in like the Grover locking rotomatics, those are, I put the rotomatics on Revstars a lot and I put the, you know, the Goto tuners on Pacificas. Um, and, you know, having a two point bridge is great, but also, you know, we put that Graph Tech black tusk nut Yep. Um, you know, so it's got like the graphite um, lubricated, you know, so it's like the strings don't get really hung up. And the key is like you just got to stretch the strings out and keep tuning it and keep stretching and keep tuning and, and doing that and then intonating it all perfectly. Um, but, you know, also I think part of that neck joint being so snug and, uh, you know, the neck being as stiff as it is, um, stainless steel frets. Yeah, Martin. Uh, just asked. Yep, it's uh, stainless frets on there. Um, we use the Jeskar. I believe that's the uh, FW5100, um, 100 thousandths wide, 50 thousandths tall, or 51. Um, yeah, so I think all those little factors, like make sure that the guitar really stays in tune, um, because if the guitar doesn't stay in tune, you won't keep playing it. Uh, that's like one of the key factors for me, um, you know, when building an instrument. Um, and, you know, so you've been playing, uh, I heard you're doing a little, little solo work now. You recorded that thing in Japan. What have you been up to um, musically while you've been uh, cooped up? Yeah, so I have a, I mean, we, we were literally just getting a, a solo, uh, like a, a Paul Heinemarsh solo band thing together you know which you started on which is really because of paul you know when pod go came out there was a you know we just i wasn't a, my normal band's band called 300 foot gorilla so anybody interested go and check 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 those guys out because we're we're still going but very very slowly there's other things going on in people's lives and stuff so um for the pod go um videos and things it was like well i need to have a bit of a band together so i got some uh, some great local musicians together uh the drummer from 300 foot gorilla um Cool. And we had to do like a lot, a bit of a live thing for some pod go stuff, which is still some of it's still the some of it's still to come out. The best stuff is still yet to is still yet to be released. Um, the video that the video that is, but we also recorded all the drum tracks. So I was like, right, if I'm if I'm going to spend some time going into a studio with a drummer, we're not recording one song. I'm going to get eight. I'm going to get eight or nine songs out of them. That's nice. you know, we're gonna, yeah, we're going to kill as many birds one stone as we can. You know, um, so yes, yeah, so all the drum tracks are done. We 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 started rehearsing and everything was sounding good. It was. A lot of it was the tracks that I did at Nam. They became backing tracks for Nam as well. So I had two two tracks that I was playing at Nam for the PodGo demos. Uh, they're two of the tracks that'll be sort of on the album. Um, and the bass players sort of sort of working through through lockdown, trying to get you know we're getting the bass parts together. And I've got maybe bass lines for four bass lines for four of those tracks finished so far, and they're all sound, they're all sound pretty good. So so yeah. So hopefully at the end of lockdown there'll be a Paul Hein. I don't really want it's not going to be called the Paul Heinrich band, but for the purpose of this conversation, it can't really. <laughs> it's like, uh, so yeah, there'll be a Paul Heinrich band, like an instrumental album of eight. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll do. There's, there's eight tracks with drums. I think we'll probably need to. I'll probably come up with something else, some little new other things without drums for. Yeah, well, that's it. great. And and if people want to find out more about like what you're up to, um, they they want to find more about your personal music. Where could they go and find that? So Facebook's the best is the best place. I got uh, Paul Hines Marsh Music on Facebook. I have my own YouTube channel, um, which tends to be just a lot of the Line Six bits that I'd record for Line Six get taken out, and I put them on there just as the sort of this, the, the 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 guitar playing sections without the without the talking. Um, so yeah, so Paul Hines Marsh Music on uh, YouTube and Paul Hines Marsh Music on Facebook. Um, yeah. Yeah, and you know if if you guys got questions about you know Helix or some tones, they can uh, get some of those from you as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. I get I get questions on it's kind of part of the part of the job, you know. I'm, I'm you know I'm full time sort of Yamaha guitar group line six. So I'm I'm pretty cool with questions coming my way on on Helix and things and and yeah presets anything like that I send out. I mean obviously because I'm because I'm part of the line six family. I'm I'm not charging. I'm not in marketplace or anything like that. You know like I don't I don't need to be because I'm I'm already my 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 revenue from line six comes in in, in different ways. You know so. Sure, sure. Yeah, any sort of uh, yeah, any presets or anything like that. I'm happy to hand. Awesome. To hand over, you know. So um, you know, I, I, I had asked uh, a few folks, um, but 
you know, is there something that you're you're doing, you know, while you're home? Um, you know, I, I asked a lot of the touring guys, like, well, what have you learned on the road that's helping you at home right now since everybody's a, a little cooped up? Um, do you have a, a little a little pearl of wisdom for, for the folks out there uh, cooped up that can be inspired by uh, Paul and his, his playing, you know? Um, the first one, we don't endlessly eat kettle chips for sort of two months because it has a detrimental effect on, <laughs> on your physique. <laughs> um, but like I said, my, my role hasn't really changed. So I'm, I'm still here and I'm still doing the demos on Podgo and I'm still putting the content together for, for, for Yamaha, you know, I think. And, and obviously being, you know, the, the whole lockdowns thing, I mean, you know, me and my wife both work from home. So there's been, in a lot of ways, there's been very little change. But what I've very much noticed is that you know, the times when you just want to, nip out for a coffee and you know and you think it's just because you want a coffee it's actually become really apparent that it's actually you need that time to just get out of the place you know when you're when you're working from home and you know obviously like you know living here and everything as well it's uh so yeah again getting out and getting out and seeing some stuff it's which is definitely some advice that i could take i could do with taking myself you know it's uh get some fresh air well thank you so yeah. much for doing this um, thanks for, you know, all, all the awesome videos and stuff and, and being inspirational for so many folks. And, uh, I hope we get to hang out in person soon. Um, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it'll, you know, it'll happen, you know, now or, you know, yeah, we'll see if Leonard Nam 21 will happen. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and obviously, you know, thank you so much for making this guitar, you know, it's, uh, oh, it has, thanks for you, know, playing. you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a I'm a Yamaha employee, so you know, in some ways, uh, you know, I'm expected to say these things. But genuinely, this is the only guitar. You know, I have a collection of guitars in there that are just gathering, that gathering dust. You know, this is the this is the one that I go to all of the time for for everything. You know. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much. No, no, thanks, thanks for playing it. It's it, you know, making something is great, but uh, you know, if it just sits in a box, then it it really hasn't you know done what it's supposed to. So thanks for playing it so much and. and being such a great supporter, but uh, all right, everybody, have a great evening, uh, great rest of your day, and um, stay tuned. We got some cool stuff coming up. Uh, yeah, it, it'll it'll be fun. We got some more artists and um, a little special event coming up. So, cheers, everybody. Great, thanks. <laughs>